Welcome to this episode of the State of Mirrorless. Today we'll be interviewing Clint Birkinshaw, um, nature wildlife travel photographer from Southern Australia. Hi, hi, Clint. How are you doing? Good, yeah, guys. How are you doing? Doing Hello. good. Hello. How are, Clint. Th how are things down there? Ah, uh, we're uh, we've just kind of exited our summer, so we're getting slightly colder weather now. Um, but yeah, not too cold. We never get really uh, too cold weather down here in South Australia, so it's still all right. Um, yeah, so uh, no, it's going good. Uh, How about the, you guys? Uh, subtropical kind of climate you have there? Uh, in South Australia, we're pretty dry, actually, in comparison to, say, the northern and northerly easterly states. Um, South Australia gets really dry weather, um, which... I like actually, so <laughs> I'm a bit of a silk when it comes to really humid, humid things. I just want to get it under the air conditioner. But yeah, no, it's that we get dry heat here, so it's pretty good. And today we have, as always, uh, Mathieu Gasquet here. Hi, Mathieu. How are things? Hi, Hugo. Hi, Clint. Yeah. Everything's fine here. It's in the morning. Another cloudy day, but everything's. <laughs> We're going to actually starting spring, starting soon. So. Oh. It should be officially already started. Yeah, well, you know, it's Astrono astronomically at least, maybe not. Yeah, well, you know, our weather is now it's a little bit weird every time and changes. And... So, Clint, uh, tell tell us a bit about yourself. About uh, I, I was reading your your website, explosiveaperture.com, and yep. it looks like you have a, an interesting uh, life story to share. You. You basically decided to uh, let it go to at some point to take up and travel around the world and let go yeah. pretty much everything. What's uh, tell us a bit about it if you want? Okay. Um, years and years of working behind the desk uh, in uh, information technology that I um, have been working in. I decided to kind of just. Uh, uh, I wasn't getting too bored, but I, I felt like I needed something something different. And this was back when I was uh, 20, 21, 21 years old, back in 2005. So I decided to, I needed a bit of an adventure, so I quit my job, sold everything I owned, and literally just took off on a one-way ticket uh, around, well, I went to Europe first just to break, you know, break in the travel leg, so to speak. Uh, but my real adventure came when I first um, quit everything and left everything behind for uh, a one-way ticket to South America, um, which is where I really fell in love uh, with life on the road and haven't really stopped since then. Yeah, I've been, uh, I stop occasionally to refund the money and whatnot, but uh, that only goes to generally like 11 months and after that, I'm basically back on the road. And so it's been like that for around the last, Decade, I'd say, ten years. I've been doing this, and it's a, um, it's a not always the most comfortable life. Uh, living out of a bag and um, having no idea where you're going to be next, it can get tiring. But it's very addictive, and uh, yeah, it's what I like. What, what I like doing, and um, thankfully, something which came from, which originally was travel driven, um, is my passion for photography came halfway through that, and. It, what a perfect combination to, to combine a, a passion for photography with the, with the travel lifestyle, which I've got. So they went really, really well, hand in hand together. And 2015, um, still going. So that, that, that's what I, I was actually meaning to ask you, if your passion for photography uh, came before or after your, your passion for travel, and it appears that it, it came right half through your your travel career. So, um, how did you get started? I mean, you were on the road most of the time. Did you? Uh, how did you find the way and the time to uh, to make your work known, for instance? Um, originally, I had. I mean, back in the day, I did the odd photography course, but I didn't really take it seriously so much to the point where uh, I'd be too passionate about it. 
Um, that came later. Originally, I was doing more of a travel blog, um, which I've kind of disconnected, discontinued that one and concentrated main on a photography blog because that's more taken over passion in my life now. But it was, I would say, around halfway through 2008 and I was uh, back in uh, South America and just witnessing these absolutely gorgeous scenes. And um, at the moment, I was running around with a point-and-shoot camera doing as best as I could um, with a point-and-shoot camera. And yeah, I started getting a feel of what works, what doesn't work, and uh, then I kind of wanted to step it up a bit, especially meeting some one or two other photographers on the road which had uh, the SLR. And I, I, I kind of made a decision halfway through that, that yes, I really want to get into photography. And it's just been down the rabbit's barrow ever since, been really passionate about it. And um, it wasn't until I would say... I was living overseas and then coming back, well, I, I picked up um, my first SLR, which was a EOS 40D at the time, and uh, lugged that around uh, northern Africa and through the Middle East on my way back to Australia and really put a lot of effort into that. And that was probably around 2010. Uh, and from then, I've kind of been obsessive uh, stalking light and, you know, chasing, trying to get the ultimate photo. So it's, yeah, really kind of spawned from a passion of travel. Um, and now probably my travels are based around uh, probably my photography and my photography one. So so you, you do a lot of uh, pre-planning when you are setting up to, to go to a destination. You investigate the best locations, best times and so on. So your travel is driven by your photography? Uh, these days it probably more is, yes. I mean, I select a area of the world which I'm really passionate about or which I really want to see. Um, and you do your research into the best seasons to, to travel these. Um, and, and so a lot of the time when I'm on the road... You were on the road and you were learning photography at the same time. Uh, do you find it, it came... Uh, to some people, uh, photography like comes naturally. They don't have much to to study. They just see the light, see the composition somehow naturally, and, and take a shot. Other people, more like me, probably um, need a bit more of uh, introduction or training into the the concepts uh, before they are really proficient. And I'm just wondering what kind of uh, uh, person are you in this respect? And if being on the road, uh, how did you manage to, to, to get information to, to see what the others were doing? How did you, how did you learn to, to take the, the beautiful photos that you take today? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> At first, I was probably struggling quite a lot. Um, a lot of the places I've been to, especially back in 2008, 2009, 2010, uh, have very limited access to internet, uh, especially in parts of uh, rural Africa and, and in South America where I've gone. Um, a lot of the, I, I didn't have a laptop for one. I didn't travel with uh, a laptop. And the internet was either hit and miss anyway. So it was generally I got enthusiasm from a few photographers that I met on the road over there. And at first, a lot of it was completely learning myself as to a big trial and error game. So it was probably a little bit slow to start for me, and I probably took a lot of, uh, a lot of misses uh, in comparison to the hits. Uh, but that was all part of the fun and the games. And it wasn't until in um, probably the last three or four years that I've been really head down, bum up, really studying um, what I like about a nice landscape photo photograph um, and really going after that type of thing uh, and, and trying to hone in my kind of niche, if, 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 you, if you get what I mean. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, there's been more of a learning process later on um, since I've had an internet and laptop. And all that. <laughs> so. Of all the places that you visited, is there anyone that is really close to your heart that you would like to go there again and again? Definitely. One of my favorite places on the planet, and I, I, me and my wife plan on going and living there eventually, 
um, is probably Colombia in South America. It's uh, it's always been really close to my heart ever since I first stepped foot there in 2008, and I've since been back uh, two additional times. Um, it's absolutely it's one of those countries where uh, you just really feel alive. The the festivities, the the culture. Um, really brilliant kind of lifestyle and fun people uh, on top of everything else. And the beautiful thing when, for a, from a photographer's perspective, Colombia has amazing mountains, it has amazing beaches and yeah, stunning jungles. Uh, the jungle is probably a little bit hard to uh, photograph due to the dangers uh, over there, um, but it is absolutely stunning uh, country to really witness landscape-wise. So. What attracts you more to a to a given place? Is it more the landscape, or is it more that the people, the culture, the climate, the food, or is it a, a mix of both? A slight mix of both. I'd say originally it was generally the type of culture and the experience I would get from it, um, traveling to a place. Um, but I think at the moment my traveling is uh, probably more geared up around focusing more towards landscapes and really uh, capturing those really dramatic, epic uh, scenes which I, I feel I really want to chase in at the moment. Um, but if I was going to settle down somewhere for a while, it would have to be a, a culture and a place that I'm interested in um, to make life interesting. Um, but short-term travel, yeah, I'm after the landscape, so I can't resist the beautiful scene opening up in front of me. So. <laughs> Is there any, especially at the beginning when you made this big change in your life, is there any time when you looked back and had hesitations in, in continuing with this new life or you, you never looked back? Um, it has been, it's been rough sometimes when you, when you literally, when you're so obsessed with traveling and uh, just bouncing from place to place. The, probably the, the toughest thing is, is stopping and saying goodbye to a continent you love. For example, after a year backpacking through South America, it was very emotional leaving, leaving the place. Um, and then the hardest part, I'd say, would be after, a, for example, my wife and I, we just did 16 months backpacking uh, west around the globe. And the hardest part of it all is coming back um, with absolutely nothing, no money, no job, no, you don't own anything, um, and you, you're starting with zero again, and basically, yeah, starting from scratch and trying to reintegrate into a life which is driven Monday to Friday, nine to five, um, yeah, appointments here, appointments there, um, rather than kind of just a, yeah, relaxed life on the road. It's definitely the hardest thing and uh, really trying to settle into that. Sorry to interrupt the regular programming, but I have an announcement to make. I recently started offering photography workshops in the best locations of the Mediterranean. We're starting off this year with a weekend workshop in the Cinque Terre region of the Italian Riviera to be followed at the end of September by a six-day long workshop in the Greek islands of Santorini and Milos. If you want to know more about our offerings, head over to www.mediterraneanphototours.com. Thank you very much. So, where are your travels, travels bringing you next to? At the moment, I'm back home in Australia. It's um, until uh, we've, uh, we've just been back here in nearly a year. Um, and it's probably my longest time in Australia since the last probably decade. Um, a little bit of a break now and uh, what I'm doing is really trying to focus in on my photography at the moment and potentially make, um, trying to turn that into more of a full-time career, um, uh, a travel photography career, which I really want to concentrate on this year and when we do take off again in the short future, uh, we'll be doing a bit of an adventure travel um, long distance cycling probably something like that mm -hmm. so uh, yes that that's to come <laughs> so what would I hear many uh, meanwhile I'm just uh, going through some of your uh, photos would we'll provide a 
distraction for our viewers. Um, I mean, um, you, in order to support your lifestyle, uh, you need your photography to, to provide, as you said, uh, an income to become like a, a full-time job. And when I hear other photographers talking about how they support their photography, they constantly tell me that it's uh, there's a lot of marketing, there's a lot of sales support, there's a lot of uh, uh, things that have accounting that have nothing to do with photography per se, uh, and that may might take 80% of their time and only 20% is dedicated to, to photography. And uh, I'm thinking how that uh, uh, is the, how is that compatible with uh, uh, spending so much time on the road? Uh, and probably the answer is just that you've been uh, steady for uh, a year or so, and that has allowed you to uh, to expand uh, your business. I think. Yeah, um, that's a really good question, and it's something I'm really discovering at the moment. Previous in in my whole past. I've uh, been working as a uh, server and infrastructure engineer uh, in, in information technology, and that's been my 100% um, of my savings for travel and photography. I'll, I'll, I'll do a contract, for example, for 10 months in IT, and generally that is enough to provide. Oh, after I quit, um, I'll then... Uh, travel for a year on that and that's generally been enough to keep me traveling for a year and then I'll come back and work another 10, 11 month contract and I'll be off for another year and that's generally how I've been going over the last uh, 10 years um, but at the moment this year I'm really trying to get ahead in photography and I'm noticing exactly what you're saying how 80, 80 even more maybe 90% of the time that you spend in photography world is yeah, driven by marketing and uh, writing uh, articles and everything like that, too, which is fun at the same time. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting. It's something I'm discovering new at the moment this year. Oops. Yeah, yes, you're there. You were frozen for a second. Okay. Nice. Um, Mathieu, you have any anything well, to add? Uh, since we also talk about cameras and about gear. Um, I wanted to ask you what you are currently using right now and if you wanted to tell us a little bit about the camera you're using, why you chose that camera. And... Yeah, I'd love to. At the moment, my, I have... This is going to be basically my, my backpack that I'm going to be traveling around. It's a... Uh, as you know, we're on the uh, uh, talking about mirrorlesses here. So um, this this is the beautiful thing about mirrorless and its small form factor. I can afford to have a half and half backpack where half of it's a, a camera bag and the other half is miscellaneous stuff which you can put in for day back. And so, of course, in here, my camera of choice right now is the uh, Sony A7R. Uh, which here it is with a L bracket on, and it's uh, yeah I've got a 50, 58 millimeter Voigtlander lens uh, f 1.4, so manual focus. <laughs> so I uh, struggling a little bit with that at the moment, not trying to nail the focus at 1.4, but it's uh, yeah it's a really nice lens and this this camera yeah absolutely beautiful. And my favorite lens, I would have to say, which I shoot all my landscapes in, would be the uh, Sony Calzeiss 16 to 35mm ultra wide. Um, and that is really my go to lens for all my landscapes. I can't resist going as wide as possible. How many batteries do you have? Because, I mean, the, the Sony cameras are really, really great, but the battery life is. Not really generous, and that is true. Um, I've, that was one thing I noticed about coming back, uh, going switching to mirrorless from an SLR. The battery life takes a massive hit. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, you got the choice of either having a battery grip or multiple batteries. And for me, 
mirrorless is uh, I, I spend a lot of time with camera on my back you know sometimes days sometimes weeks so weight is absolutely crucial so I, de- I, I generally travel probably with about three to four additional batteries mm-hmm. um, and they're very very light so that's how I generally get away uh, with extending my battery life yeah. I um, imagine sometimes you can have problems to charge batteries as well I mean you- if, uh, if you have multiple batteries and they're almost all empty and so you have maybe multiple charger and you have to, you know, be sure to charge at least one or two batteries so the next day you won't, you won't be yep. limited by <laughs> what you see when you want to photograph. Uh, yeah, very true. Um, yeah, that's probably, especially if you go on a week or two long trek, for example, even, even a week long trek, you, I think everyone's facing what happens when you get to the end of your battery life. I think you have to go into a, a really long trek or something like that with watching what you shoot and not going too crazy with a shutter button uh, to preserve uh, battery. Um, but with four batteries or, or so, I can generally pull over a week um, out of the battery life of, uh, before I need to start charging them again. Um, there's good things on the internet where you can, the charges where you can charge two at a time, uh, yeah. which is really helpful. Mm-hmm. And I've done things like long, I've cycled from London to Athens at one stage uh, on a push bike. And so I was sleeping in a tent every night. And this is in the middle of a European winter. And um, what I did then, I, I took a, it's a, a battery and a solar panel, which I draped across the, uh, uh, back of my bike, which charged the battery, and then at night time, I could that battery I could charge my camera batteries, and I managed to get a few charges each time out of that. Is it fast to charge with the solar panel? Uh, uh, yes and no. If you've got a good day, it's not too bad, but the moment you start getting an overcast day, yeah, mm-hmm. it, it struggles a bit. But the good thing is with those batteries, if you ever, if you want to stop off somewhere and you're at, you're at a cafe, you can charge your big storage battery um, mm-hmm. with a PowerPoint as well, and that goes really fast. So uh, I, I generally found that was my method of going. But that was only when I did kind of more adventure traveling, uh, adventure cycling, long distances where I just never would have access to uh, PowerPoints. But aside from that, the last 16 months we did backpacking. Um, I found it uh, not a problem with about four batteries seemed to be probably around the per- perfect uh, amount for me that I was traveling with. Mm-hmm. One, one hint though, I will say, I, I did struggle in Patagonia when it was minus, God knows what, it was really, really, really cold. And in order to really get my, uh, extend my battery life, I had to sleep with my batteries in my pocket, in my sleeping bag. Otherwise, if I wake up in the morning and they're, they're freezing, I'm, I'm probably going to get like 20 shots out of them and yeah. they're, they're going to struggle. But really notice a different difference keeping them warm. Mm-hmm. So I, I might have missed something because I had a little bit of a distraction here with people coming and going. But, um, uh, you, sh- you showed two lenses and one was the 1635, which is... Uh, uh, wide angle for landscape work, and I don't think you're shooting much landscape with the with that Voigtlander 5814, especially when you're shooting at 14. You use that for portraits. Yeah, exactly. Um, I also this this last, one of the, the one of the recent trips we did I did with the Sony NEX7, which was kind of, I, I got that before the A7R came out. Um, and that had I had a similar setup in terms of focal lengths with that one. Um, but by far, you're, you're correct. I rarely shoot any landscapes with a 55 or 75, uh, around about millimeter. Um, that's generally for I use that for all my street photography. Well, 90 percent of my street photography. Um, I absolutely love a nice prime lens for walking around, capturing portraits and, and scenes on the street. Um, there's something just really kind of refreshing about um, using a prime lens, using your feet to do the work and getting that really nice, beautiful, low depth of field 
um, with creamy black in the background. I think that for me personally, that's perfect for street photography. And I like and probably just a little bit more compressed than the standard vision, so maybe I, I, I like hitting around maybe 70 millimetres or, or so, 75 millimetres for street photography. Um, and yeah, as you said, the uh, 16 to 35 is uh, is my favourite. Mm -hmm. My favourite is taking nature uh, and landscape photography. Any other lenses that you're planning to get or you would like to get? Because I I often hear uh, the people who are using Sony that they are a bit complaining about the the fact that the uh, the, the Sony offering uh, in, in lenses is not that mature and as uh, ample as other brands. So with uh, with adapters, you can use uh, other off-brand lenses. Um. The other one I was potentially considering getting before my next trip would be the 70 to 200 millimeter. I think that would be really nice for some street photography as well. Um, I think Sony, their Sony Maker Native, one of those, I think is that Sony G models or something, um, uh, at F4 from memory. It's been a while since I've looked at it. Um, but I'll be thinking about going to a, a 70 to 200 millimeter. But in all, uh, I'm not convinced because I'm kind of on the, I'm heavily on the bandwagon of travel as light as possible. Um, the lighter your load is, especially when if you've been on the road for months and months on end, you can really notice uh, how fatigued you get and disappointing, not dis not disappointing, but if, if you've got a lot of lenses and a lot of heavy gear, um, it becomes a little bit of a burden about carrying your camera backpack with you everywhere you go. And I, I only generally find this after a, a few months on the road. Um, and so it's really important for me that my gear is light as possible. And so I'm probably only, only going to take two lenses, um, an ultra wide, a prime somewhere around the 70 millimeter mark and if I'm going to be daring I'll probably take a 70 to 200 um, but absolutely no more than three. Yeah I also think that the, the Sony A7 is a full frame camera and while the body is definitely smaller and lighter than most uh, pro level DSLRs the lenses aren't that smaller. So if you have a small camera, then you add an L bracket, battery grip, extra batteries, and uh, three or four big lenses, you are going to negate all the benefits of a smaller body in the end. It would not make your backpack much lighter. Yeah, I think yeah. that's the, the, I mean, the, I, I wouldn't call that an issue, but uh, certainly, I mean, uh, Sony is working to keep as light as possible and as compact as possible system, but you also have to listen to feedbacks. And for example, I, I was the photo I was in uh, the photography show in Birmingham uh, last week, and I tried the new lenses. This is the 35 1.4, uh, the 28 millimeter with the two um, converters, and the 35 1.4 seems a really nice lens, but it's really, really DSLR size lens. The 28 is interesting because you have these two converters and you have to have a fisheye converter and a 21 millimeter equivalent converter. So basically with a very small uh, package, you have actually three different focal lengths. And I find that solution interesting. And uh, the lens and the converters are small. Um, but of course, I mean, if you already have the 16 to 35, probably I, <clears throat> It's something that uh, can basically do almost everything that those lens and converter can do. But um, um, but definitely, I mean, even the zoom lens. I mean, the I mean the seventy two hundred. I, I I tried it as well. It's it's compact for what it does. But uh, some people complaining because it's not a two point eight constant aperture zoom lens. And but I guess that if we've, they have made a two point eight instead of f four, it will be even bigger. So I mean. Somehow they have to find a good compromise with that. But. Yeah, uh, I agree, and I, I do find that. I think Sony have done really well with the 16 to 35 millimeter, which is uh, looking uh, quite a bit, or not quite a bit, 
it, it's smaller than uh, the competitors uh, in the size, um, but the the and weighting. Uh, but the other lenses are definitely a find, as you say. They're all much of a muchness around the same size as the Canon and Nikon and the other full frame camera lenses, um, which. Yeah, I, I guess I um, I have to start making decisions when it comes to that. The cameras, the, the camera weight saving is amazing. Um, and one thing I guess I have in my favour is I love prime lenses um, for street photography, and that's generally more of the only zoom, more zoomed up uh, type photography I do. And luckily, prime lenses are slightly uh, a smaller. At them zoom capable lenses and I do find Sony potentially heading down there instead of so much bringing out f2.8 all the time uh, bringing maybe f4s to the table which they can fit smaller which is fine for me especially with ultra wide because you struggle to get any form of depth of field with ultra wide anyway um, where that generally tends to matter is in deeper focal lengths, uh, which I love using at maybe a single prime for and um, getting away with that for my travel. But regarding the size, of, I've always wanted an L bracket. It helps so much with portrait photography, I mean portrait orientated photography on tripods. Mm -hmm. But I've just kind of refused to just tackle that onto my last, what was the last SLR I had a couple of years back was a 7D. And I just, I, I didn't want to. When I knew I was going to be traveling for five months or so, I I really didn't want to tack a L bracket onto that. But now I find with the Sony A7R, with the L bracket, it comes to the same size of like a mini SLR, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, while it's probably still a little bit lighter, I get the ability to use the L bracket as well, which I've always wanted. So. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm yeah, looking at, at some of your pictures from Jordan. And this is Wadi Run, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, I've been there. I'm envious because I've been there years ago and I didn't get that light. Light was actually pretty bad. I don't have any good pictures from <laughs> from my stay in Wadi Run. Uh, uh, just wanted to ask how much post processing you do on your on your photos. Uh, does it take a lot of work to produce an image like this from uh, the starting point? That image that's on your screen now, uh, not very much at all. That would probably be about 10 minutes or so. Um, the lighting was just kind of really nice in there. Um, generally, with post-processing from start to finish, I'll spend... Uh, these days, no more than two hours on a photo. Uh, that includes cropping and uh, any form of cloning um, and combining multiple exposures together, um, whether I create those multiple exposures from the same photograph or from multiple that are taken, uh, and combining those together with luminosity masks to kind of really get that uh, nice natural lighting. Um, probably around two hours. I, I like increasing the the color uh, a little bit and um, but still remaining to, towards more of a natural a natural image but with my own little artistic kind of twist to it if you know what I mean so uh, not 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 heavily photoshopped in which you probably imagine what a typical heavy photoshop thing is but um, I, I run it I run it through the mill and uh, bring down the highlights of the shadows and hopefully spend no more than two hours on a on a nice photo that I'm happy with. Cool. Where's the button? There. Right, we might be joined soon by our friend Lady Pros. So I sent an, him an invite. Uh, yep. fel fellow Aussie <laughs> Australian. Um even it up a bit. What, what is there any uh, advice or tip that you would want to give to an, an aspiring uh, travel landscape photographer that wanted to to pick up a bit of a life uh, life on the road style lifestyle? Yeah, um, 
Yeah, for sure. True. Photography, traveling is all about the lifestyle, uh, as you know, and, um, and photography is all about having fun. Get, get your passion and, and follow and be prepared to not be com completely happy with your shots for a while, especially if you're, trying, if you're looking at photographers that you really admire and, and trying to maybe replicate and get a feel for um, the, the style of photo you like. Um, the, 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 the best advice that I can probably give is to just be prepared to come away with far more shots that you're not unhappy with than that you probably will be happy with. Because when everything does come together eventually and you get that really, really nice shot with all the lighting and composition that you're really happy with, all those failed shots that you, you haven't been too happy with all become worth it when you got that one. And you might have to go through a couple of hundred <laughs> until you can get that. Um, but keep shooting, keep practicing, keep playing, and your good shot portfolio will... will will accumulate and uh, yeah, it's all worth it in the end. Cool. Hey Lee. Hey Lee. Hi. How are you? We're good. We're fine. Good. 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 Thank you for letting me join. Thanks, Clint. How, how, how are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. Not too bad. Not good. too bad. How are you? Very well. Very well. I've just joined at the last minute. <laughs> are you inside a box or what? Inside a box, yes. I'm at my standing. I'm at my new standing desk. The view is amazing, though. Yeah, because we are we're just seeing a box in your back. <laughs> are you it's at better work? audio, right? Mm -hmm. Are you at work? No, no, no. I'm at home. I'm at home. Yes. Yeah. So we were talking with Clint about his uh, his photography, his travels, and. Okay. And everything? Any? Do you have any questions to ask, or any anything you would like to to add? Yeah. What's, What's the highest that you've uh, ever climbed to, Clint? <laughs> um, now I don't know in feet for all these people who are operating in Imperial, uh, but the highest I've been to is uh, probably just short of five thousand six hundred meters. Um, uh. Which I'd really like to go higher, and I've got my mind set on going higher. Um, but yeah, that was very much a struggle as it is. <laughs> yeah, so what's it like at that sort of altitude when you go and take photos? Ah, oh, it hurts. Walking's a walking's a uh, a problem, <laughs> let alone taking photos. Um, yeah, but yeah, where I did that was actually a couple of places. Um, Notably, Nepal, uh, when me and my wife uh, went on a three-week trek, which we actually eloped in smack bang in the middle of the three-week trek uh, as we just crossed uh, a place called the Chola Pass in the Gokyo Valley in Nepal, which was uh, over 5,500 metres. We turned around this mountain and a beautiful valley opened up in front of us and we're on the, on the side of a glacier and uh, we decided, uh, it was just us two, no one around for miles and miles and miles, and uh, yeah, we decided to elope there and say our own wedding vows and slip the rings on, and uh, yeah, so that was good. We met, that was probably one of the highest as well, and then the second highest was we eventually worked our way around after a week or two to the cat meeting up with the top of the Everest base camp crew, and yeah, there's a little mountain there you can trek to above the base camp and have a nice view of all the tallest peaks in the world. So uh, it's, a, it's a tough one, though, trekking at that altitude. <laughs> it's yeah. breathtaking. <laughs> <laughs> Any place where you have not been to that you would really like to go? Yeah, it's quite funny. I've never really explored uh, North America. Um, much I've only ever been to LA there, which doesn't really count. Um, so I've, I've been all through Europe, a lot of North and East Africa, a bit of the Middle East, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, and all of Latin America, but I've never really explored, explored North America, and 
although I see a lot of so many lately, a lot of these beautiful photos coming from the west uh, coast of North America, and it makes me really want to get there. Um, but one thing actually that's heavily on my mind is. I went to Iceland right in the middle of winter in the peak of the aurora borealis and didn't see a single light in the sky. I got absolutely screwed over with the clouds. And so I'm dead keen to go back and we have plans of uh, hitting up northern Norway which will be on a bit of a cycling adventure trip we do and uh, hopefully yeah, cruise along uh, in Norway, Iceland, uh, Greenland for a trip uh, before uh, heading over to live in Colombia again. So cool. So, any anything else you want to 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 let us to let us our viewers know about you, about uh, your life, your career, your photography? Any recommendations? Closing words. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, words of wisdom. What would it be? Find, find out really what it is that you enjoy and uh, yeah, really chase after. And if that is, that is a, a career in photographer, photography for those inspiring photographers, really work at it. And don't be afraid of disappointment every now and then, but use it as enthusiasm to get back out there. And Yeah, you only get one last, so uh, definitely live it. You only live once, right? Yeah. yeah. That's what they say. <laughs> That's good advice. Good, very good advice. Yeah. Um, Lee, anything yes. else you want to add? Well, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm sure that's the advice that um, you took, Matthew, when you moved from Italy to the UK, right? Following well, your dream. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was a big move for you. It's, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say that we had a, uh, what, a decision that drastic decision like uh, Clint had, uh, but uh, yes, we, we moving from Italy to UK was a big step for us, and uh, I mean, I, I agree, I mean, sometimes you just have to feel it and say, okay, I think that's the right thing to do and just do it because you, we, we, you'll never be 100% sure of what's going to happen either way. I mean, even if you stay in a place because you think you have a comfortable job of because for whatever reason, but you never know what can happen to so If it's something you really feel you should do, or I think it's the best thing is try and see how it goes. Not be afraid of failure and I guess, I mean, of course it's, uh, I think it can always uh, make you, it can always be a, a good experience. You can always some, learn something from it, even if it doesn't end exactly what well, well, you were planning to do or planning to be, but I think it's, if you don't try, then you, in a moment in your life, you probably you will regret, regret it. Yeah, and I know for me, Matthew, when and Clint and you go when when I relate that to my photography, it's just like one of those things I have to not limit myself to one, you know, brand. Um, I've got to go out there and actually try lots because you never know what's around the corner, and and you find those experiences always lead to something. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for what Clint said about trying something new, getting out, because you just never know what's going to happen. My last piece, my, if I can give a final piece of advice to everyone, photography or non-photography related, it would be, be good to your mother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, always. Yeah. We're almost at the top of the hour, so I would like to uh, close this. Uh, just asking Clint, uh, where, where can people go to keep up with your many activities and travels and whatnot. Yeah, um, if you're interested in following, uh, reading about any of my previous travels or following any of the future ones I'm going to have and uh, getting stuck into any of my photographs, um, you can find me at Explosive Aperture, which is the website's just down there uh, below my name. Uh, and there you can click on any of the links uh, to get me on any of the social contacts, Google+, Facebook, Twitter. Um, and, uh, yeah, there you can read a bit about me and uh, view my photographs if you are so interested. I think people will be definitely interested in, uh, in viewing yeah. your photographs after I've shown them. Just a little, bit, a little selection of them on the, on the screen here and there. 
uh, really amazing landscapes and, uh, and vistas. So people should definitely check out your portfolio. It's, it's really, really great. Okay, so thanks for joining us today. Uh, to you, Clint and uh, Mathieu. Thank you very much for having me, guys. It's really nice to uh, meet you all and put faces and names. And, and Lee as well. So it was just uh, for a very short okay, crash. few minutes. <laughs> Cheers, Lee. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. See you, guys.